from a mother and daughter cycling holiday in Sweden. Heading to an amusement park in Gothenburg. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the GCN, GCN Show. Welcome to the GCN Show. Coming up this week, cyclists are less than human. According to 30% of people, apparently, which doesn't sound good, but what does it actually mean? We spoke to the author of a new study whose results were rather worrying for all of us. Yes, we've also got some bad news for Chris Froome, new Tour de France team jerseys, a brand new Tour de France bike, and a whole section of the show dedicated to dogs. Which sounds a bit weird, doesn't it? Mm. Um, it's not very French today, is it? Well, that's a little bit better, isn't it? We kind of thought that we'd better make some kind of effort to get into the mood for the upcoming Tour de France, which starts this Saturday. Did you see the French national anthem now? Excellent. That's New Zealand one. Oh, not again. <laughs> Right, this week in the world of cycling, we learned that one of the big Tour de France favourites, Jai Hindley, has been pioneering some brand new training. Yeah, indoor training, outdoors. Yeah, here he is, look, all epic and gritty, in the mountains, in the rain, possibly even snow, on his Wahoo kicker. Now, we asked Wahoo, and they said they wouldn't recommend using their kicker in the rain, although it is sweatproof. Uh, and Sai can attest to that, can't you? Yeah, I really can, actually. I mean, I really have tested that on thoroughly. Um, I do like to think, generally, that one of the benefits to indoor training is to actually be indoors, but then I'm not currently in with a shout at a Tour de France podium, so maybe, no, actually, I've just lacked that kind of creativity, <laughs> you know? We also learned this week that there were highs and lows for two former Tour de France winners on the comeback trail. Chris Froome has not been selected for the Tour for Israel Premier Tech, but Egan Bernal has. He's been called up for his team, the Ineos Which Grenadiers. Is great news for him, isn't yep. it? Uh, now, a few weeks ago, you might remember that we mentioned a piece of research that had just been published, which found that of the more than 500 people surveyed, an astonishing 30% considered cyclists as less than human. Yeah, and what's even worse is that safety gear, like helmets, which we think make us safer, make that problem worse. And in fact, high vis makes cyclists seem the least human. Mm. Now, we are no scientists, no. Si, are we? But that sounds pretty bad. Yes. So we got in touch with the lead author, Mark Lim, who kindly took some time out from his family holiday. What a legend. <laughs> it's pretty cool, isn't it? Pretty cool. To explain what the findings actually mean beyond the scary headline and what we can potentially do about it. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Super, super interesting headlines coming off your study. First of all, could you explain to us what dehumanisation actually means in this context? Yeah, certainly. And th thanks for having me on. Uh, de dehumanisation, basically, it, well, it, it's, it's in the name of itself. It, it means to believe somebody is not completely human, that they don't have the, the characteristics that, that make us human. And because of that, the concept of dehumanisation is often linked to um, you know, various atrocities is its more common thing. Like you would, you would see that with genocide and the like would be, or, or war, war-like conditions where the, the enemy is completely dehumanised in order to make it easier to exterminate them. So that's kind of the most extreme version of dehumanisation, but it is on a spectrum all the way through to, uh, you, you know, more, more minor acts of aggression and harassment. And do you know from other studies before yours whether dehumanisation is something that affects other transport groups you know car drivers or pedestrians things like that or is it unique to cyclists yeah i'm not aware of it being applied to uh, pedestrians and car drivers and honestly that the link to cyclists is is also rather new so our study is very much off the back of a study done by alexa del, Bo del bosque from monash university in australia and that was the first study i'm aware of it was back in 2019 that showed that that demonstrated that link that many people thought that cyclists were less than fully human. And, and I guess the most disturbing part of their study is that they also then showed associations between the, the more people felt as though that was the case, the more likely they were to either undertake harassment of cyclists, so you know, shouting or yelling at them or something like that, through to aggressive actions as well, such as 
throwing an object at them, swerving their car towards them. So that was the sort of a very disturbing study that came out of that 2019. And our study tries to follow along from that study, uh, try to replicate parts of its findings and also try to, to build on it in terms of some explanations for why. So we were looking specifically at whether cycling a tyre um, is partly responsible for that. And mo- most of our, our first thoughts were around the, the mandatory helmet laws we have in Australia, which requires everybody to wear a, a helmet if they're cycling for any purpose. And the idea was that the obstruction of the hair and the eyes is what is partly responsible for dehumanisation. To, to assess this, basically, we, we had a series of photographs of cyclists in different attire, particularly headwear, but also a safety vest. So uh, they were, we had a, a male and female model, uh, both holding a cycle to show that they're a cyclist, but all the rest of the details are the same, same sort of colour clothing, same background, etc. And the only thing that was changing between the photos was uh, the, what they were wearing. So in one photo, they had no no helmet. Another, they had a basal cap. Another, they had a helmet. So that's both of those things are checking for the obstruction of hair and eyes. And in the final photograph, we had no helmet and a safety vest. Uh, they were asked which of these photos looks less human. And then people, you know, they, they have it, they were given all possible combinations of those photographs. And based on their responses, we can then sort of calculate the likelihood of them choosing which is more or less human. And what they found was, what we, what we found was that the, uh, it wasn't quite what we expected. We thought that the obstruction of the hair and the eyes with the helmet and baseball cap would be the most. In actual fact, the baseball cap was sort of the second least. No helmet or anything was the, um, the most human, so to speak. After the baseball cap was the helmet, and then the safety vest was after that, which suggested it wasn't, in fact, the obstruction of the hair and eyes that's causing this. It's just something about the equipment. And so what do you think that we can do with those results then? Because it kind of implies, correct me if I'm wrong, that if dehumanisation of cyclists is in itself a really negative thing, then actually some of the measures that we might be taking to potentially try and make ourselves safer be wearing a high-vis vest or a helmet are potentially putting us more at risk it, like of other types of you know roads road rage or aggression or that kind of thing yeah that that's that's right you could you, it could be looked at that way and you know many of the the qualitative responses we had to the survey people said they they felt a bit like that they felt different when they were when they were out cycling in their road kit compared to cycling in their just in their everyday clothes they they felt as though they were harassed a lot more when they were in their road kit for example so what was the the long term answer to that i i think it's you know, I, I don't think it's necessarily one of changing a tire. I think it's one of what what is behind this, and I, I think it's we our, our survey didn't really test this, but we theorised that it's a, a concept of othering, and that because cycling is still seen as something that, uh, you know, it, it's not a completely mainstream activity uh, because of the the delays and the sort of aggro that I guess that exists uh, amongst some in the motoring sector towards cyclists. The more someone wears safety equipment that's related to cycling, the more they connect themselves to that cycling othered group, which is then dehumanised. So I think this the solution there is perhaps more one of what we need to do to make cycling more normalised overall. And that, I think, is having it, having more people cycle. And you can absolutely feel that. Like I, I'm, I'm on holiday here in the Netherlands at the moment and riding around here on my bicycle is... Um, infinitely more relaxing i don't feel dehumanized or i don't feel anyone's being aggressive towards me at any time it's, a, it's an entirely normal activity and everybody knows it everybody does it everybody's granny goes to the shop everyone's mum does it their brother sister so of course cyclists are human because just so many people are able to do it whereas in australia i, I mean it's it's quite a hostile environment to cycling or to cycle around you have to really know the routes or go well out of your way to take safe routes or else you're on on roads with traffic and uh, obviously that's quite that safety issue itself is is probably the biggest deterrent to making cycling cycling more normalized so with your urban planning hat on then what comes next because it feels like a catch-22 situation in that more cyclists is potentially going to make things safer but it's hard to entice people to start cycling if it's not as safe as people would want in the first place 
Yeah, that's right. And I, and I do wonder about the effects of things such as mandatory helmet laws or wearing a vest and things like that, if, if it gives the wrong impression of cycling as well. I mean, in some cases, it certainly is quite dangerous in Australia, for example, to ride on the road. But in most instances, I think if you're on reasonable cycle infrastructure and you're traveling at, at you know, normal speed, I mean, like, you know, 20 kilometers an hour or something like that, going about your daily business to go to the shops or visit a friend or you know, just your, your general utility like cycling, it is, it is absolutely not an inherent inherently dangerous activity at all. Uh, it's only the interaction with motor vehicles that makes it so. Um, and I do wonder if the, the, if there's the sense that everyone has to sort of kit up to do that kind of basic ride, if that alone is sending a message of, of, um, of an unsafe activity when it, when it isn't, and if that is also a deterring effect. I, uh, I have to say I, I completely agree with you there. It's something that we've touched on previously, how, you know, people can people feel like cycling is more dangerous than it really is but uh, but yeah thank you so much for for your time mark and enjoy the rest of your holiday beauty thanks simon thanks very much well thank you again to mark for that what do you think dan i mean it is an issue isn't it well, and an yeah, increasing say, one even beyond the scary headline i still find it quite worrying that you could be looked at differently based on a high-vis jacket or a helmet that is quite scary, isn't or it? Or just your mode of transport. Because whilst cycling is a passion and a way of life for me, for a lot of people, it's literally just transport. Like exactly. the same as walking to the shops. It starts making you question, when are you going to be at your safest? I know a lot of people out there don't wear helmets because they don't agree that they make them necessarily safer with the data that's out there. Other people do, but this might make them think, well... Am I more likely to be involved in a crash and need the helmet that I'm using if I'm wearing it versus if I just didn't and I looked more human? Yeah, I think what Mike was saying about the fact that it'd be really interesting to replicate this study in other countries to show whether, for example, the Netherlands, which have an incredibly high proportion of people that use bikes as transport, whether they have the same issue of perception of dehumanisation. Because if you find that out, then you could potentially say, well, OK, therefore, to improve the situation, we need to get more people on bikes to make it more normal, or whether there's something else going on. Personally, I blame social media. But then I blame most things on social you, media. You have blamed quite a few things on social media over the course of the GCN show over the last 10 years. Well, I mean, see, see what you think as well. <laughs> no, but seriously, get involved in the comments section down below. I mean... Mark did a brilliant job of explaining it and how it's perhaps not quite as grim as that headline suggests. But nevertheless, there is something going on here, something that needs to be addressed. So let us know your thoughts in the comment section down below. And now it's time for Cycling Shorts. It's now time for Cycling Shorts. And this week, happily once again, we start with news of new Cycling Shorts. Well, it's mainly jerseys, though. Yeah, it's it? mainly jerseys. Uh, yeah. Several Tour de France teams have got new threads for the biggest race of the year. Jumbo Visma, winners last year, they've gone for this design. Uh, that's all right, isn't it? I'm a massive fan. Well, I did rate them on the racing news yesterday. I think I gave Jumbo Visma six out of ten. Yeah, I prefer last year's Tour de France mm. kit, frankly. Uh, Bora Hansgrohe have gone for this. What do you reckon to that one? Well, I don't really see how it harks back to their 10 years in the Pro Peloton, which is what they said it did, but it looks nice. Uh, well, they have a, the name of every single rider who's competed at the Tour de France for that team over the 10 years printed in very small font on the back. That's quite sweet, isn't it? It's yeah. quite good. I gave that a 9 out of 10. I just like the design of that one. Yeah, all right. Now, I'll give that, um, I'll give that a good, good marks. Okay. Uh, this is Movistars. Mm, it's all right, isn't it? Yeah. I, I think I said I quite like that one. Yeah, so pretty much, yeah. Uh, there are also new jerseys for Uno X, mm -hmm. which you are a huge fan of, aren't you? No, that, that rated bottom of the new ones for me. Although there were people in the office who disagreed. They really disagreed. They love it. The thing I struggle with is that Uno X this year came out and said, we're not changing our team kit for environmental reasons because we feel that we should carry on mm. with the same kit. And I loved that. I thought it was really cool. And then now, unfortunately, they've had to change kit mid-season. So, you know. Well, that, yeah. Actually, we didn't mention that Mobistar claimed their kits to be the most environmentally friendly ever used at the Tour de France, but presumably not as environmentally friendly as if they'd just kept the kit <laughs> that they've been using so far this year. Yes. The I think that's called greenwashing, <laughs> isn't it? Uh, anyway, yeah, who's next? Uh, we've got this that Mark Cavendish will be wearing in the team of Astana, Kazakhstan. Wearing it as he rides to a glorious 35th stage victory. Yeah. Um, I like that, actually. 
It's a bit like tie-dye, really, isn't it? Yeah, I, I like that. It's a daring design, I would say. Yeah, Team DSM, Firminich. Yeah, that's their new name. So that's the only reason, I think, for their change of jersey at the Tour de France. I'd say, unfortunately, that the new logo of the company does not look quite as good as the previous logo, so they didn't have much to work with. I don't think that kit looks very good anyway. No, no, I'm glad you agreed, but then I am very conscious that we are now both in our 40s, <laughs> perhaps in even less of a position to judge how things look from a fashion perspective than we were before. You did also refer to the cycling kit as threads, so, you know. Well, yeah, because I'm, con you know, that's the sort of thing that I would say if I was a few years younger. If you bought a drop. And I'm still saying now. Yeah, OK. Uh, right, the one that we're still waiting for is Little Trek. That one apparently will be revealed tomorrow or Wednesday, at least if you're watching this on Tuesday. Uh, but their social team has already done a great job in activating their new title sponsorship from the budget supermarkets. On Monday, they announced their lineups for the Tour de France Homme and Giro Donne in the style of a little checkout receipt. Yeah, it took me quite a while to figure out why Matai Schelmos and Shirin Van Onroy appear to be free of charge from Lidl, um, particularly because they're two of their best riders. Yeah. Um, but then I worked out that the number represented the number of times they've actually participated yeah. in the race. I, know, yeah. so you know, I thought it was very clever, unlike yeah. you. <laughs> well, I worked out in the end. Yes, well done. <laughs> now, talking of activating sponsorship, Alpes and de Kerning announced their Tour de France roster on a Zwift ride on Monday evening which is after we filmed this GCN show, so we can't run you through the list of names. We can be fairly confident, though, that Matthew van der Poel will have made the final eight. I would have selected him, Yeah, I personally. think I would have done as well. Um, yes. Anyway, sticking with racing, there are two very notable riders who won't be on the start line this year. Chris Froome, who we've already spoken about, but also Sam Bennett, winner of two stages and the green jersey in 2020. He's been snubbed for the second year in a row by Bora Hansgrohe, mm. which... Um, oh, poor old, poor guy. I know. Yeah, I feel bad for him, I've got to say. Uh, we're talking about Froome. He spoke to GCN on why he'd not been selected. He sort of blamed equipment to a degree on his lack of results so far this year. But he did vow to return to the biggest race in the world in 12 months' time. Using what equipment this time? That's bizarre, well, isn't it? I can't get my head around that, if I'm honest. Doesn't seem to hold his teammates back that much, does it? No, well, they've only had four wins this year, but they did, of course, have a great Giro d'Italia where they didn't pick off that big win, but... There's some youngsters up the road fighting for the win on almost every day. Maybe, uh, what's his face, G? David. Derek. Uh, Derek G. <laughs> <laughs> Derek G would have converted his four second places to four glorious victories. If, I mean, I don't, literally don't know what no. Froome is banging on about. Maybe it's disc breaks still. He still doesn't <laughs> like them, does he? Quite possibly, yeah. Get with the time, He'll be in Chris. his 40s as well, though, soon, won't he? Well, pretty much, yeah. He just needs to get with a programme like us. Yes, he does. Yeah. Anyway... The other active pro with multiple Tour de France wins, Tadej Pogacar, will be on the start line, of course. Yay! And he is going to be dressed in Slovenian colours. Yeah, because both Pogacar and his fiancée, Erska Zikhart, did the double in Slovenia, winning both the time trial and the road races. So they got to visit the podium together to receive their jerseys and medals. Isn't that cool? Very cool indeed, yeah. Yeah, it's like a date. Mm. Don't think that's ever happened before. I can't imagine no. a couple doing the double at a national championships in the elite category. Uh, just before we move on from racing, now seems like an opportune time to remind you that the Tour de France starts this Saturday <laughs> and the Tour de France fam Alex Zwift oh, starts wonder on the what day this that the was all men's about. race finishes. <laughs> yeah. But, needless to say, well, I'm very excited about it. Well, I am too. The opening week looks cracking. It does look amazing. And, of course, we've got live coverage uh, of both on GCN+. Plus. Now, terror restrictions do apply. New Zealand, we're really sorry. Yeah. You haven't made the cut again. No. Um, amongst other people, this... Uh... Yeah, absolutely. But it is going to be quite the month, isn't it? Vinegar versus Pogaccia in the men's, Vollering versus Van Vluten in the women's, with a whole heap of world-class riders chomping at their heels yes. and getting stuck into stages. <laughs> it is going to be. I'm always like a kid at Christmas at this time yeah. of year on the lead-up to the Tour de France. It's probably the hardest first stage and the hardest first week of the race that I can ever remember seeing. So it's going to be massively exciting right from the very start of the race. So if you're not already subscribed to GCN Plus, now would be a very, very good time to do so. Get on it. We would love your company for the entire race. The only warning we would give you is that you might need to take some time off work, mind you, because there is that much content. Yeah. You can, of course, watch it on demand. So you can always do a day's work and then watch it in the evenings. And we've got highlights and we've got everything else. But if you genuinely want to absorb every moment, every kilometre of the race, you know, just hibernate, yes. basically. Yeah, take a um, month of work. Yeah, anyway, 
Moving on. Here is a story that I found in Lincolnshire Live. Now, Lincolnshire, for our global viewers, um, being a county in England. Anyway, a guy, right, was so determined to get his hands on one of the newly released, or re-released, should I say, rally chopper bikes, which was um, a 70s icon, that he abandoned his wife and children on the family holiday to drive several hours to (laughs) the rally store to get in the queue for when it opened at 7am. Well, that's some commitment, but... Is it admirable, would you say? <laughs> no, it reminds me a little bit of the card that I got last week. Have a look at this. It made me chuckle. I did. Moving on. Uh, look, have just launched a couple of new bikes in time for the Confidence team at the Tour de France. The 795 Blade RS looks amazing, especially with those Karma wheels. So it's 7%. Hang on a sec. Let me guess. Stiffer. Yes, by 7%, as I was saying. Yeah, and it's more aero. It is. Yeah. By 10%. Ooh, and yeah. it's lighter. I'm not sure about lighter, oh. but it's an aero bike and it comes at 890 grams, so it is light. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, I will see if I can get my hands on one at the Tour de France. I am heading out there on Wednesday of this week to um, basically rummage around bicycles for a couple Very of days. Good. Yeah. And I get back in time to watch every kilometre live on GCM+. Plus. None of this standing at the roadside for me. <laughs> I want to be, uh, I want to be indoors. Like Jai Hindley should Yes. Been. Anyway, before we move on too much, one thing I noticed about that brand new look bike, it's tiny, isn't it? It looks really small. Well, I guess, yeah. In those photos, it must be like a 52. No, maybe? but not the actual, the frame size. I mean, it looks like sort of a little toy version of a bike in those press photos that they released, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, I see what you mean there. It does. It looks like um, like a Playmobil bike, doesn't it? That's really weird. <laughs> um, anyway, if you're interested in new tech, which we know... Tons of you are. There was a whole load of it last week over on the GCN Tech channel. Ollie had been trawling the halls of Eurobike, so make sure you check out the videos that he brought back from there. Indeed. Loads to see. We are going to finish cycling shorts with that story about dogs. Okay, what is going on here? So my sister Cow sent me yesterday. Okay, I mean I do like dogs. What's your favourite track? What? Yeah, this this is the band dogs that I'm oh. talking about. So this is a collaboration between Nick Kelly and Sean Miller that I saw, or Carol saw, on the South Wales Guardian website. The pair embarked on a six gig tour culminating with a set at Glastonbury at the weekend with Miller travelling between gigs by train and Kelly transporting the equipment between those gigs by bike. Oh, he did his short straw, didn't he? Well, he did, yeah. It was basically in an effort to start a conversation about more sustainable ways to tour live music. Well, band on a bike... I like that. Mm. That is cool. I mean, admittedly, you know, it'd be hard for like an orchestra, wouldn't it, if you got the double bass? It would be. But uh, no, I do like that. I think maybe Elton John or Axl Rose, who were headlining Glastonbury, well, yeah, should have cycled I, the, the, there. The number of different guitars that Slash used on Saturday night at Glastonbury I mean, it would, be, it would be hard to transport them by bike, I think. Well, maybe he should have just had one favourite guitar, like the gravel bike of guitars, like the do-it-all guitar. No, no. He, and then he could have, like... He's definitely an N plus one uh, guitar. <laughs> this is my aero <laughs> guitar. This is my lightweight guitar. This is my uh, gravel guitar, my mountain bike. Yeah, no, no. no I mean. Okay. Um, anyway, that would have sparked a conversation, but fair play to dogs for doing yeah. that anyway. Axel Rose has got, like, a gravel voice, hasn't he? <laughs> yes, he has now, hasn't he? We'll finish cycling shorts there. Hack forward slash bodge of the week now. Our first one this week comes in from Cycloprinskoda. Roadside zip ties galore. I thought you were gonna say bodge straight away. My tire started to disintegrate after 30 kilometers of planned 180K ride. Fortunately, my mate always carries some extra zip ties. Believe it or not, those lasted 150Ks and I got home on my bike. Shall I buy a new tire or leave it as it is? Right, buy a new tire. Yeah. But that is cool. That is what zip ties are for. I mean, not literally just that, but that whole kind of like, I'm completely up the proverbial without a paddle. Um, three zip ties gets you a hundred and, what was it, 150, 150 kilometers. Well, that is cool. I mean, I'm going to vote hack. I'm going to vote hack. But I would like to point out maybe think about buying a new tyre before your 180 km ride because if it disintegrates 30 k's into it, presumably it was fairly well worn before you even started the ride. Well, the thing is though, like, I know that feeling. I did it the other last week where I was going out for a mountain bike ride because that's the next big thing. I don't really heard. Mm. And uh, I saw that there was effectively a hole in my front tyre and I went, well, I haven't got a spare tyre. I really want to go for a ride, so I'm going to go anyway. So just winged it. And it was fine. 
But presumably you weren't going on a 180 kilometer ride. No, no. I was not. Um, also, I wonder what that'd be like going around corners on tarmac. <laughs> You'd think like at the moment where all the plastic meets the tarmac, it might give you a few little moments But well, just the noise of it would give you the jitters, wouldn't it? Yeah, maybe you should have put like the cut bit of zip ties further around to act as tread. Basically, yeah. so you got loads of I think of we grip. may be overanalyzing it at this point. Right. We're only on the first one. Yeah, okay. 59% um, of you lot said that was a hack as well. So that's great. There we go. We're off to a good start, aren't we? Uh, next up, Anya 56 ANK, the king of bodge, apparently. BMX grips, different colors, flat bar brakes on wow. a drop bar, gear lever held on by a zip tie in the middle of the bar, <laughs> Phillips screwdriver used to fasten the stem. Cloth on bridge of suspension? Oh my goodness me, what's going on there? Is that like a mudguard? Um, seen on the train to Port Talbot, which uh, is in South Wales. One thing that uh, they haven't pointed out is the cat eye lights that seem to have masking tape around the front <laughs> of it. I mean, what is that? It, we, it's been quite some time since we've had a, a hack forward slash bodge submitted with so much going on in a single photo yeah. of the bike, isn't it? That is absolutely terrifying. I believe that's what's called in the trade a death trap. <laughs> so, uh, well, yeah. I'm going bodge. I'm, going, I'm actually going bodge, 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 bodge with this particular one. Yeah, that is horrific, isn't it? Mm. Um, wow, almost a unanimous bodge as well. I think 93% bodge is about as bodgy as we've ever had. That is, um, yeah, something to behold, isn't it? Sabanta sent in a chain ring fix. So the chain ring broke on day three of a seven day bike ride with my dad and brother in the middle of nowhere, managed to cable tie it to the other chain. Uh, cable tie into the other chain till I could get to a bike shop hours later. Oh, I would. Oh, no, to the chain ring, sorry. This is our third zip tie submission out of three. <laughs> um, but, but hot on the heels of the zip tied cassette. Yes, exactly. Last week yeah, or the week before. Yeah, I mean, but again, I've got to say that if this gets you home slash to a bike shop without ruining your ride, then. Um, then it kind of is okay, isn't it? Mm. To use zip ties, as long as you then fix it. Yeah, I, I guess it just needed to keep it out of the way, because hard to get that chain ring off without a crank removal tool, isn't it? Well, that's why you should always have an eight mil Allen key with you. Although actually well, that sometimes... looks like an old school one where you used to have to sort of uh, effectively push the crank or pull actual, the crank off. A cotterless yeah. crank extractor. That's the word I was looking for. Thank yeah. you, sir. I'm not sure. Uh, I'll go with hack because of the uh, the nature of the situation there. Yeah, I'm going to go hack as well. Yeah. Uh, and it's 70% of people went with a hack for that one. Maybe we should do a video on GCN Tech, which is uh, five amazing uses for zip ties. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to present that one. But yeah. um, anyway. Uh, right. Lastly. Should, should have kept that to ourselves, like, because rival channels will be nicking that brilliant. <laughs> rival <laughs> challenge, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we're all friends, aren't we? <laughs> uh, right, Patty McManus, anyway, finishes things off. Uh, they say, coordinate chain, brackets waxed, and shoes. Wow. My oil slick chain wax and my ecoy shoes. That I've never does... seen matching shoes and chain combo before. No, it's something I haven't seen either, but now I have. Well, and the good thing that. is that if you scuff your shoes against the chain, Still going to be the same colour, isn't Absolutely, it? Absolutely, yeah. Mm. That's very cool. Um, my shoes, like my current DMTs that I'm using this summer are grey. Mm. So, um, I mean, they all are matching, is what you're saying. They currently are matching, yes, um, as long as the chain is clean. But, um, but yeah, no, I think that's very cool, actually. I like that. Yep, I like that as well. I'll go with hack. I'm going to go with hack. And 78% of you lot did as well. Wow, it was cut and dried this week, wasn't it? Hardly anyone on the fence about no, anything. No, I like ones that are on the fence. Yeah. We'll have one next week. If you'd like to get involved ready for next week, don't forget to submit your hacks or bodges to the GCN app. And there are some there for you to vote on ready for next week's show. Haven't had to go very far for a water bottle this week, have we, Dan? <laughs> no. It's time now for Caption Competition, that part of the show where you get a chance to get your hands on a coveted GCN Elite water bottle. Now, these are limited edition, the yellow ones, despite the fact that we're surrounded by mm. them. There's not many of these, so get in quick if you want to buy one. We, but We could be quite rich, actually. They're so limited edition if we sold these. Yeah. Kept them to ourselves. With a free anyway. Campagnolo 11 speed 1123 cassette as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway. We're digressing slightly here. Uh, right, part of the show where you have to caption a photo they're about to give you, stick your caption in the comments section down below. We'll pick a winner next week. Results first. This was Juan Ayuso at the Tour of Switzerland pointing to his shoe. Hmm. Which, incidentally, I think Ollie 
took a closer look at those shoes when he was over at Eurobike. So he go and did. check out GCN Tech if you are interested. His new DMT shoes, which he was obviously liking, wasn't mm. he? Yeah. Uh, anyway, the winner this week is Paul B eight five eight seven, who put Juan to buckle my shoes. <laughs> Very good. Nice, Paul. I like that very much. Can I also just say, by the way, um, after your poor effort last week in front of the live audience, mm. uh, Kim Miller said, I um, know oh it wasn't Kim Miller, sorry, uh, Matt Frobisher, sorry, said, Dan's expression from the audience member roasting him mm. during the caption competition was priceless. He looked like he was ready to retire from the GCN chair. <laughs> to be fair, I thought you took it spectacularly badly as well, but it turns out you hadn't actually heard what she'd said. Was that right? I hadn't, no, I, could, I had to ask you a later day you know, what, what was the great caption. But it, well, I think that was more about the guy that said that my caption was terrible. Yeah. Although he, I might not have come in ever again, but he did come to me after and said, where I come from, that expression means it was really good and not really bad. Oh, here we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in anyway, English, it anyway. meant Dan was rubbish, but in, uh, <laughs> in Germany, it means Dan's amazing. Well done to Paul B. Get in touch with us on yep. Facebook with your address. We'll get that bottle sent out to you. This week's image comes from the Belgian National Championships from last Sunday. Uh, I actually need you to join in with me, Sarah, on this okay. one. Okay, all right. Okay. Uh, you start. Uh, are you able to tell us how you took this win, Remco? My hands are tied. Quite funny, though, isn't it? So, well, it, it's not really. Uh, even I'm going to admit that. But if you can put a funny one in the comment section down below, you stand a very good chance of winning the bottle. I think that's a good photo, actually. I think there's going to be some mm. great captions this week. Get stuck in. We have got some cracking content coming up for you on GCN this week. But before we let you know what that is, a few of our favourite comments from underneath last week's video. Content's a bit like threads, isn't it? It's like a trendy word. Yeah. We've got content. We used to make videos. Now we make content. Yeah. Hopefully people listen to this on audio and assume I'm much younger than I look. <laughs> cool, anyway, let's move swiftly on, shall we, to the comments. Uh, under five simple tips to look effortless on the bike, uh, Getter99 said, going for a wee while still rolling has got to be the ultimate pro move. Slightly inappropriate on a morning commute, perhaps. I think that's probably why it's a pro move, isn't it? Because on a public road, it's mm. fraught with dangers. As we found out from someone who commented on the GCN show the other week, who fell off whilst they were having a wee, didn't they? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Although, it, it, you know, it, it can be difficult during the Tour de France, which is starting this coming Saturday, because there's so many public on the side of the road that there's barely a gap. So you basically just get fined for urinating in public. Really? Yeah. Well, and every yeah. kilometre is broadcast live on GCN+. Well, so there is that as well. You're basically that, on TV That's on the up wee. to the producer to change camera shot or the cameraman to pan away slightly. Anyway, uh, Matt Rose... 30,000, but tell everyone on your group ride that it's your recovery day. Well, yeah, that's a good shout. I'm well, taking it? things easy today. Yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah, it's text by that one. Uh, right, um, under bikepacking is shit, uh, which uh, was Ollie being uh, at his absolute best. Uh, Andrew McAllister said, uh, Connor's relentless cheerfulness versus Ollie's ceaseless snark. Love it. And yeah, it, mm. it, they make a great couple, don't they? And see, Campbell 87 wrote, of course Ollie enjoyed the coffee. It was made with an AeroPress. Ah, uh, yeah, Very there good. you go. Uh, commuter challenge underneath that, we had 99 Hangman 99 saying, that auto shift bike deserves a GCN tech video all of its own. Well, yeah, maybe we'll have a look at that, mm -hmm. shall we? Uh, and then uh, Do uh, DJ, sorry, I thought that was Dr. Lloyd then, but no, DJR Lloyd uh, said, just the image of Connor on that folding bike was worth doing this video for. Amazingly hilarious. It'll make me smile for the rest of the day. Should we have a picture of Connor on Go his... Go on then. Yeah, it is quite funny, yeah, isn't it? Is yeah, funny. Uh, underneath how much faster is the best climber in the world, Ash Hardling, Harding, put uh, the look on Alex's face at the end. We've all been there, mate. Brilliant effort, guy. It was a very long climb. I mean, yeah. I'm like, I mean, it really was. <laughs> all of us got to the top and we're like, oh, we kind of underestimated yeah. that. Well, I started it back in April and you still got past me before the top. It's true that, mm. yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then uh, a lot of comments saying that we should have brought Ollie. Um, Ollie was part of the team, but he uh, deselected himself because he wanted to go to Eurobike. Um, mm. And also, I think, do a, ta a time trial, which was downhill with a massive tailwind. Because <laughs> he, he got his PB time, a very impressive time. Yeah, he did like an 1840 
for a 10 mile TT. Oh, wow. So, yeah, that is swift. Uh, that is very swift. So, yeah, Ollie probably would have made all the difference. Yes. But he wouldn't have been able to have a head start. He should have no, just gone up with And it wouldn't further. have been downhill or tailwind, would it? <laughs> anyway, what's coming up this week? Well, on Wednesday, we've got some ultra cycle, ultra distance cycling tips from none other than Mark Beaumont. Always worth listening and Absolutely, his yeah. advice. On Thursday, cycling advice that sucks. Two separate videos, we should point out. That's we, right, yeah, we, good we, advice. We're not analysing Mark's by tips by <laughs> the day after he's given them to us. And on Friday, we've got the beginner's guide to the Tour de France. Yeah, an impenetrable race for those that don't know. So that's the video for those people, or you, depending on whether you do or you don't know, if you know what I mean. Uh, anyway, Saturday, uh, as mentioned earlier on, I'll be out at the Tour de France this week, and so we are sending a video back. Don't know what it is yet, just keep your fingers crossed, okay? That'll be Saturday's vid. Uh, and then on Sunday, we do a lot of chat about how Andrew Feather is the mm. world's greatest male climber. There is someone better, female rider, Eile Gardner, who has more QOMs, more Strava segments than anyone else on the planet, I believe. Uh, and she set out to tackle the Col de Tourmalet. Uh, so Manon was there to check that one out. That's so uh, yeah, super cool. Can't wait for you all to see that one. Brilliant stuff. Uh, just before we finish, we have a new documentary out for you this week for GCN Plus subscribers, all about Sonny Colbrelli and his transition, enforced transition, from pro cyclist into the normal world after it was deemed that he'd, his heart wasn't up to continuing racing. Yeah. It's an absolute tearjerker, that mm. one. Yeah, so genuinely, sure you've watched oh. that. Uh, we've got the World of Cycling out for you on Wednesday this week and next week, but after that, we'll be out on the Tour de France rest days to give you something to watch then. Yeah. We should probably wrap things up, shouldn't we? Well, we should probably also say uh, we are sat surrounded by uh, GCN merch. Oh, yeah. Make sure you head over to the GCN shop because uh, this is all limited edition. Uh, and very cool it is too. Shop.globalcyclingnetworks.com. Dan's got a baked bean stain down the front yeah, of that well, one. I tried to wipe it clean with a laptop screen. <laughs> Cleaner. We can all see Isn't the stain. So yeah, it's really obvious. Dude, I'm be One bean can do a lot of damage <laughs> as it rolls down your t-shirt. <sighs>